Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this, the third virtual event of the sixth Unbound Book Festival. My name is Gabe Freed, and I'm a member of the festival's programming committee and director of poetry programming. Tonight, we have the pleasure of hearing poetry from three terrific poets, Diane Glancy, Grant Blackwell, and Karen Crago, all of whom have deep ties to Missouri. You may know that, 2020, that 2021 marks Missouri's bicentennial, and this is one of several Unbound events this year that focus on Missouri, which we want to acknowledge is the ancestral home of many violently displaced indigenous peoples, including here in Columbia, the Kickapoo, Osage, Peoria, and Ocheti Shakoin. Please remember that if you miss an Unbound event, Everything that we show is available for viewing or reviewing on both our Facebook page and on our YouTube channel, which you, so you should subscribe to. As you may know, Unbound has always been completely free to attend, and this wouldn't be possible without the generosity of hundreds and hundreds of people who have supported us financially over the years. On behalf of everyone who volunteers for Unbound and everyone who attends these events, we're so grateful to each and every one of you who has been kind enough to give. If you'd like to help us out, please go to the website, unboundbookfestival.com, and click on the donate button on the homepage. We're a registered nonprofit, and we are completely run by volunteers. So everything we receive goes directly into putting on these events. Thank you. Support comes too from the City of Columbia, specifically the Office of Cultural Affairs, and the Convention and Visitors Bureau. KBIA and Como Magazine are our media sponsors. A full list of our sponsors and supporters is available on our website. Particular thanks this evening to tonight's event sponsor, the Daniel Boone Regional Library. We're very grateful to them for their support over the years. If you haven't already, please take a moment after tonight's reading to review the whole schedule all three months of it and plan to attend as many events as you like. We'd love to see you. Our first poet tonight is Diane Glancy, who I understand is coming to us via a slightly tenuous internet connection in rural Texas. So keep your virtual and actual fingers crossed. Uh, and if you know anyone in Texas, tell them to stay off of Diane's Wi-Fi. Uh, Diane is from Missouri, originally from Kansas City. She is the author of many, many acclaimed books of poetry and fiction, of essays and plays, many of them highlighting the experience of Cherokee and other Native peoples. She's also a filmmaker, anthologist, and a dedicated educator. Over the, over the past 30 years, she has been the recipient of too many awards and honors to name, but here are a handful two National Endowment for the Art Fellowships, a Minnesota Book Award, an Oklahoma Book Award, an American Book Award, and a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Native Writers Circle of the Americas. We are thrilled to have her back in Columbia where she was an undergraduate. So please join me in welcoming Diane Glancy. Thank you, Gabe. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Missouri has always been an important place to me. I was born in Kansas City. I graduated from Normandy High School in St. Louis and the University of Missouri at Columbia. And for a while, I even had a cabin on the Lake of the Ozarks. I'm very interested in history and I'm glad that you mentioned some of it. The Missouri Territory was part of the 1803 Louisiana East by the Mississippi Mississippi River. It was called Missouri after the Missourias, an Indian tribe whose name meant muddy water or town of the large canoe or wooden canoe people or he of the big canoe. In 18, 1839, some 11,000 Cherokee passed through Missouri in a line probably eight miles long during the Trail of Tears, the removal of the Cherokee from the Southeast to Indian Territory, now Oklahoma, north through Tennessee, Kentucky, and west 
through a southern point of Illinois, where they crossed the Mississippi River into Missouri. They walked some 370 miles from Cape Girardeau on the Mississippi River, north through Waynesville in central Missouri, then south again through the Missouri Hills toward a corner of Arkansas to Fort Gibson Indian Territory. You have to decide how to tell a story. And I chose 12 people, some fictional, some historical, to tell the story, sometimes overlapping. Someone called it a commitment as they walked. And I'm going to be reading from Pushing the Bear. Government and a few soldiers accompanied the line of Cherokee. But the leaders of the detachments were Cherokee and some white ministers who had evangelized the Cherokee. They often were on their own reconnaissance as long as they kept moving. And I'm reading from a passage through Missouri. I guess you could call this prose poetry. We crossed a stream and it was the white Whitewater River or Castor River or Cape Creek. I looked at the map. We'd been on the trail nearly four months since we left North Carolina. Our trail had been northwest through Tennessee and Kentucky and Illinois. Now in the southern part of Missouri, we still walk northwest. Some of the men questioned the way we walked. In places, the trail narrowed to horse paths and crude wagon ruts ruts between settlements. The trail's longer than it should be. Tanner looked at the map. Look how far north we've come. Maybe there's a swamp. Maybe the hills are steep. We'll stay north with the trail marked on the map, my father said. Somewhere we'll turn south into Arkansas, into Indian Territory. The men slaughtered a horse when rations were low. They divided it for women to cook over several fires. The saliva in my jaw made a sharp pain. The pack dogs snarled for bones. Behind me, I saw the long trail of cooking fires of my people. How many won, how many would end, we didn't know. There we would start over with nothing. Would we plow the fields with our fingers, plant corn with our toes, cut down trees for cabins with our hands? Would Jesus rain seed corn on us? The soldiers argued with the teamster hired to watch the march. I held Luthi and the boys against me in the dark. Now several men from the two groups argued. Once I thought I heard Nabote's voice. Like the Cherokee, not all white men agreed with one another. The land sounded different here, but the trees still spoke. There was one leaf hitting the sapling, clicking. I listened. It sounded like a soldier's bayonet hitting his saddle as we walked. It sounded like the women weaving the river cane baskets. I closed my eyes with memory. The white traders had brought, bought as many baskets sometimes as they did deerskin. The leaf kept clicking in the cold wind. I watched it again. I was telling a story of our march. I would have the tongue of a leaf. I would tell the story, I thought. They're even here, I grumbled. I saw the farms across Missouri, Cape Girardeau, Jackson, Fredericton, Farmington, Caldonia, Massey's Ironworks, Waynesville, Springfield. I, I followed Oganaya's finger on the government map. Look there, after Waynesville, we'll be dropping south. How far do we have to move to be safe from them, Oganaya asked. The white men had seeped into the land like water. Everywhere the Cherokee walked, it was soggy with them. I could see the trails of their smoke through the woods. A baby was given to a passing farmer at one camp. In another place, I passed two children hiding in the bushes. Maybe they'd been put there by their parents who couldn't care for them or relatives after the parents died. Let some farmer pick them up the Cherokee would be scattered everywhere. There was a voice somewhere with all the voices on the trail, ancestors, conjurers, people, even the voices of the animals and the land. I was almost sure I heard a voice. You brought us through fire and through the water. Maybe it was Bushyhead preaching in his sleep. It 
sounded like one of the sons I could hear in the minister's voices. It woke me in the night. There was something that made sense. I just couldn't see it. But look at the churches in the towns we passed. It was their God, those people who made the Cherokee walk. It was men like Chief Justice Marshall, though Marshall tried to be just. Andrew Jackson himself probably sat in a church Sunday morning near the comfort of a wood stove, a hearth fire and supper waiting in his house. How could I understand? It churned in my head like a dasher stick in the milk. How could God allow men to walk the trail? This is the voice of Lacey Woodard. I unbraided my hair and covered a small girl with it to keep her from shivering. You are a small animal, I said, feel your fur. I took the child's hand and rubbed it over my hair. You are warm under your fur, little rabbit. I sat under the blanket near Lacey during the rest stop. I felt the bruise on my ankle. I saw my swollen legs. I originally drove the Trail of Tears in my car all 900 miles, not at once, but over um, a period of time. And I had stopped once at, the, at a very lovely museum in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, and they had a Teamsters government journal up on the wall, and I was copying down various incidents, and somebody came up to me and said, we can give you that in a book. So that spared me a long time of standing there copying. There were government issued uh, uh, provisions, rations, I guess you could say, along the way. The various contingents followed one route west, though some took alternate roads and trails because of the harsh winter of 1839. From the Mississippi River crossing to Jackson and north to Farmington, the Cherokee traveled well-defined roads. Beyond these eastern Missouri towns, the route followed Indian trails, horse tracks, and poorly maintained postal roads connecting scattered settlements. At Farmington, the route turned west through the Bellevue Valley to Caledonia, then northwest to Steelville. The trail crossed the Merrimack River at the Ironworks, then joined a road west from St. Louis. For the Cherokee, the trail west passed through or near Little Piney, Waynesville, and Onyx before reaching Springfield, Missouri. The 17th halted at Whitewater Creek, 4 p.m., issued corn and fodder, cornmeal and beef, 13 miles today. The 19th, marched at 8 a.m., halted and encamped at Wolf Creek, 14 miles today. The 21st, a refusal by several to march today. Allegedly, they would wait for six fa sick families to catch up, marched at 8 a.m., in defiance of threats and attempts to intimidate. None remain behind, passed through Caledonia, 14 miles today. The 22nd, marched at 8.30 a.m., passed through lead mines, halted at Scott's at 4 p.m., issued corn and fodder and cornmeal, 13 miles today. The 24th, considerable sickness prevailing, halted at Hussock Creek, 12 miles today. The 25th, Dr. Townsend advised a suspension of our march in consequence of the severe indisposition of several families for a time sufficient for the employment of such remedial agents as their, as their respective cases might require. Sickness continuing to increase, moved detachment two miles farther to a spring and a schoolhouse, obtained permission for as many of the sick to occupy the school as could do so, a much better situation for encampment than on the creek, sickness increasing. The 29th, buried corn tassels child today. The 4th, marched at 9 a.m., buried George Killian and left Mr. Wells to bury a wagoner who died this morning, scarcely room in the wagons for the sick. The 8th, buried Nancy Big Bear's grandchild, marched at 9 a.m., halted at Piney, a small river, rained all day, encamped and issued corn only, no fodder to be had, 11 miles today. The 9th, March 9 a.m., Mayfield's wagon broke down at about a mile, left him to get it mended and, catched up, and catch up later, 
halted at Waynesville, Missouri, 4 p.m., encamped, issued corn, fodder, beef, and cornmeal. The 14th, halted at James Fork of the White River, and so forth. Maybe one more. The 15th, Joseph Starr's wife had a child last night. And I'll finish with a piece by Lacey Woodard. I walked as if on a white field of clouds, my feet not touching the ground. I was so cold, I felt warm. Still I walked beyond anything I could have endured. Oh, mystery. Oh, unexplainable God. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that poignant tour around the state. That was wonderful. Our, uh, our second poet hails from the other side of the state, from St. Louis, and is making his second unbound appearance, having given a thrilling performance as part of our event at Cafe Berlin in 2019. Grant H. Blackwell, AKA Bewell, or Eddie English, is a visual artist, poet, novelist, and scholar. He is the author of Ant Life and Marie. Blackwell is, the, is a founding member of Indie Ground Entertainment and the Big Black Lies Art Crew. He is also a graduate of the University of Missouri here in Columbia, and is, and I'm quoting here, a father on necessity's path for a daughter and life to emulate. Please join me in welcoming back to Unbound, Grant Blackwell. Well, thank you, Gabe. And thank you, Diane. Um, I'm just going to get started. When the violent death of Blacks started becoming real-time public knowledge, I was often asked what I thought about the situation. Very matter-of-factly, I told them that I believe should something like that ever happen in St. Louis, Missouri, then the grassroots re response would be heightened and the protests would be different. I was born, raised, and living in St. Louis, Missouri on the August 9th Michael Brown was murdered, and as my hypothesis burned the city and shot itself, I wanted to capture a mood as well as speak to how we got there. So I began writing STL, which is the first poem I'll perform tonight. STL is an alliteration-driven statement employing only words starting with the letters S, T, or L in that order. For example, spatially too little swath tucked literally. Okay, most of my work involves quotes, so that's where this city is going to start as well. STL. As I drive around St. Louis and see all the vacant lots and blocks and run down and boarded up buildings, I ask myself, what caused all this? Ron Fagerstrom. La Selva trapped leather sale and the trade luff shaped this landscape stratified transmontane lit stone tilt and latifundia. Securing the track license swimmingly, the Needville's lumbar safaris thresh Lorax sycamore tons, log skinning their luxuriously synthetic tundra longitude stagecoach travel leeway silt. The telos liquid dies sooner than laggingly. Servile to Saint Lovature, stomp trusty Leclerc striding two door, letting secessionists then loricate the sheer territory's Louisiana sugar trove. Lord Sheffield trumping Limoges' saintly titled Lewisite and transported letters, suds, timber, lard, and salt to Farages, livestock sustaining the Talmadge Law, shamefully traduced lashes, and syncretized tourniquet linens. A short time later, state's truce lapsed, Sherman triumphing, Lee surrendering tattered lunettes, and signed treaties luring the southern trolley leverage, slaves turning loose station throng limbs, slowly transversing the Laclede steamer turbines lodestar, a sundown town legitimizing search and thralls, lividly seeking transformative labor, shortages teamed limpidly, so the leniferous shoulder, the tough load, settling Theodore Link's striker tableau and lubricating Sir Topham Lacuna spatially too little swath tuck literally. Stuck their languishing subsidized trepidations and the lurid spritz tan lepers shot to Ledoux senile tradition. Lair separating a total lopsided tubescence, lugging the 730 lineages, scaffolding thrust or Lindbergh spirit, thwarting Langston's scheduled Tuskegee launch, sadly, throughout the lumpen, soul train lining slump tenements, lavish sneakers treasured like sterling trinkets, luxate the stem trade lacking, schools tracking a learner. The supernal tranter's lummy sneak thief latch string, a toothsome lick sacrilege and telesis least wise, satirious and tawdry ladies shaking that lipid, soiling the Tina Loop stars tamed livery stable top of them. 
Lone Sharking Tenders Legal and Snooty Templars Lead Spruce Tula Layoff Sands a True Lacrimal Semblance Tempering Luck. The Stiff Tule Litigation and Travolti Teflon Luminous Sirens Trail of Linated Swisher Tearing Lime Spliff Taxonomies Lay Sprout Tossing the Lasso Squadron Ticket Lottery Spurious Tabloid Libel Set Tripping Loudly Stan Tukey's LA Sapphire Troop Lodges Sip Tussing and Leak the Seville Trunk Laser Scrums Talionis Lexing A Scarlet Tide Shell Toe Loken Serepetously and targeting lieutenant stifling teen lamb, sadate lifer, sardine tin lemming, slaffly tub lathering, and shuttle trekking lightly. Shorties take losses, siren toddlers lackadaisically splurging textile limburger spread thin. Literally, Senegal trick labyrinth, spearmint tasting Laura Lard smoke, triggering lung sarcoma treatment largesse, sourer than lemon shogun takeouts, London sun triglyceride lunches. The suetarian last supper's top lentil stomach teaser leasing, a suicidal thought lilt steel taupe landing spectacle, tourists lauding the sleigh throne locale, second tier levees, splashing a thread and lattices, shoddy thoroughfare lanes, shredding tires, leaning sedan tubes lumpy, and slanting transmigration lukewarm. The smart talk leaving stoop terraces and lickety splitting tragic Lambert Shawshank tunnel, lately snotty Leslie Spadden tribulations linger the stinky turd loose subdivisions tribalist liniment. Strom Thurman Lilliputian, side tongue lipping, a solipsistic typhoon's lyrical slur taunting lunacy, shade and fruit in two times looting the sequestered turf's lemony snicket tranquility locust, scalding tolerance, locking salasis, and truncating a Lego skyscraper tattered limbo surrounding the thrifty lunatic Sanford tizzies laterally shuffling Texaco lots. Okay. It was the first days of March 2020, and the pandemic was growing closer. Everyone sensed something would happen, but we didn't know what or when yet. I was on work break discussing the whole anxiety when a coworker goes, man, I wish Hunter Thompson was here to write about all this shit. Reflexively, I go, hey, Hunter Thompson passed. The writing's up to you now, bro. He gave glance like I was nuts. But right then, I was determined to make something for him and Hunter Thompson. However, feeling the singular outbreak would not suffice, the piece became about all sickness and viruses of an era and an attempt to define a generation by them. As well as the atmospheric bomb test slash nuclear accident, full solar eclipses, panic, toilet paper brands, and the hot zone by Richard Preston. The CDC and WHO alliterations are hidden tracks, and I wrote this during the lockdown. You get quotes to start this one, too. Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Revelation 16, 1. It was sometime around mid-afternoon on deadline day when the swine began pounding my door. Hunter S. Thompson. Standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, alas, alas. Revelation eighteen ten. The hog was in the tunnel. Hunter S. Thompson. This next piece is called Generation of Swine Flu, um, based on Hunter S. Thompson's Generation of Swine. This is for Hunter S. Thompson and Blake Dorth, the cook that inspired me to write it. Survival of news printable to the fittest mistake began as its milk and Honeywell Melpa means made Merica Gripe's agent. Guns buttered the guinea and goat food, chaining Irma to Bridgeton Infernos for the iodine infirmed dumpstered pearls that peppered Passel standing afar for fear of torments. Mal warned in our masquerade, halfway even noon kill-offs meant mummery and ham-fisted piglies in a poke sprung, sometimes super soft and scot-free, when the swine began pounding my teepee for Spanish ladies totality, Nat Turner, and Russo in brookery revelation of rich Preston RNA from the forest of Dean Kuntz's royal wormhole. Center for Diseased Candida Copy de Certo, Certain Diarrhea, Coli, and Cottonelle Drought Coronium's Carbon Dioxide Chamber Committee for Depleted Cognac Code and Decommission. Cesium Core's Decay Chain Cavern Digs, Cooling the Compost of Dead Chipmunk Cremini Deserts, and Carlsbad Condensed Downcomer Compounds for Detonation Crippling Claritol D's Complement. A cytotoxin deficient cold canary doves curie, coalescing Darigold cattle cups, dandy and child cancer detections, congenital centriol for dolphin calamity, septable deer cadgers in Connecticut. Dean creature? 
or the compromised dioceses coughingly coronative droplet carizas coloring diabetic contagion and COVID dactyls covered centrum for the deterred carpal clostridium difficile and Charmin squoles the strontium 90s generation of jambon and mud and covens COVID and our covenant was fair gammon even halfway malworn in the masquerade grins lie rooting a fence quilted northern bound but leap year of a sponsor rat flea swap miles from ordinary corona with old lime disease generation de certo totality spanish ladies and nat turner stood aground a cloven hooked heart streaming coronal storm worm for bat bird and bothered bovines milked honeywell or how hampshire hog heliport rode high on Hagata gatherings hunter hawk moss finding batista beaches in bulk bay bean spill and vials of wrath emptied like pearls peppered before stuck squealer tunneled road of silk sars and chicken shit spring Sometimes super soft and scot free that flew thrust angels into sickle cell and strontium rookeries rooted everything but the Carson sinks plug paper clipped to bellies like sugar loaf census strains out sprinting subsidy by miles from an ordinary western happy Orwellian what happened over winter hibernated on wind. As the feral flitch feasted on Christine like lizard loaf to sugar Lysol and lorication, lazy Latin loins buried the Leonard Bear and Borealis shred and rain whiffs of isopropyl, a pinhole meant to kill the nightingale perigee through pupil darkness and Duroc, the drug dog of Dresden rats. Our quilted kafos contained of asthma feed kings and Augean's unclean Siberian notes of sick men standing afar for fear of tormented babies of Boeing bit bacon's rebellious seventh generation of swine flu's death head and filter front. Mistakes began as its milk and melpamine grin that lied wrath vials empty of coronal mass ejection. When swine began pounding my TP, it was super soft. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine. Revelation 14, 19. Buried in fire and ripped to shreds like lizards. Hunter S. Thompson. It began as a mistake. Charles Bukowski. The pigs meant to kill it off. Hunter S. Thompson. We wear the mask that grins and lies. Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Okay. I would like to take this time to remind everyone with me tonight that today is the one year anniversary of the untimely passing of Gianna Bryant, age 13, and her father, Kobe Bean Bryant, one of the best competitors of any sport I was privileged enough to watch growing up. And I would like to take a second to ask for a moment of silence for the memory of Gianna and Kobe. Thank you. The last piece that I'm gonna to read tonight is a tribute that I wrote to Kobe Bryant, one of my heroes. Um, this piece is called Crazy Eight. One. A numero statistical bio of Kobe Bryant, born August 23rd, 78, day and month totaling 13. Kobe's initials, chronologically the 11th and 2nd letters of the alphabet, also total 13, and he played high school ball in Ardmore, PA, zip code 19003, digits totaling 13. Kobe Bryant was drafted with the 13th pick in 96 and married on April 18th, 01, day and month totaling 13. His alter ego, the Black Mamba, is 13 letters, and Kobe's historic 81 came on January 22nd, 06, day, month, and year, totaling 13. On April 12th, 13, he tore his Achilles, and the day, month, and year totaled 13. Kobe Bryant's last game was on the 13th of April, and when he and daughter Gianna, aged 13, crashed in Calabasas on January 26, 20, the day, month, and year totaled 13. Again, the model of the helicopter in their accident was S76, digits totaling 13. A numero statistical bio of Kobe's Adidas camp number, 143, the digits of which total 8, just as the June 26 date he was selected. Eight was his initial number for the Lakers, and he perished on the 26th day of January. Digits totaling eight in Calabasas area code 818, digits totaling 17, which is eight when reduced numerologically. Joe, Kobe Bryant's father, played eight years pro in America, retired, then played in Europe for exactly eight years.
The Adidas Crazy 8 was Kobe's first sneaker, and on January 30, 20, day, month, and year, totaling eight, I completed my tribute alliteration called Crazy 8, then looked at the clock like when Exia came at 3.37 p.m. and the digits totaled 13. Two, Indra's Door Playbook. Beef, but also Kobe. God's door or tortoise in Swahili, the angulate being a South African variety. A black mamba kills employing dendrotoxin and degage means easy or unconstrained in manner or address. Calabaza converts to squash and adders a snake and Rick Adelman coached the kings. In Scottish law, a person to whom properties conveyed is the disponee. While Starberry, Dampier, Shuttlesworth, Allen, and Iverson, the answer, were Kobe's draft mates. Moreover, the pilot was Era Zaboyan. Igor Sikorsky designed the aircraft, and Adidas isn't an acronym, but was founded by I.D. Dossler in 1949. Darnier is French for final, last, or ultimate. Um, I think this is one where I don't really want to talk about it. You know? Like I'm trying to escape it. Draymond Green. Three, Crazy Eight. After decades indoor, dribbling a Spalding all day, I dirge about Sikorsky, adding date integer datum again, slithered a Crazy Eight antidote Darnier in the Dampier Allen shuttled answer drafts, Italian, ditching amateur stats on the Crazy Eight, Ardmore diplomas and patient degage at 17, an Afro disheveled icon, Durham Air successor, Alcinder's dynastic inductee, directly admits Springfield's Crazy Eight, adolescent, deified, Indra's door adder striking Adelman, Dirk Indy, and Doc Auerbach. Swahili angulate dendrotox inflicting dosage at staples, adding date, energy datum again, slithered April's dub injury, demanding Achilles surgery after decades. Indoor, dribbling a Spalding all day I dirged the S76 and Crazy 8 was a dreary. Ice dull, AM Sunday, apartment distracted, instant dispatch, auto-rotating, spam article developments, I doubted accuracy of a squash Angeles design, Igor defeasance, and era star buried Crazy 8 alive. Disponi instance daughters are shrill another damn immortal dead shaken abruptly by crazy eight four Kyrie Irving he was just easy to approach with those types of questions about what goes on on a day-to-day basis of chasing something bigger than yourself and when you're trying to leave a legacy or leave something of a mark on the game there's going to come a lot of sacrifices there's going to come a lot of hate there's going to come a lot of love there's going to come a lot of balance that you must create in your life and he left a lot of teachings a lot of breadcrumbs i call them and i just followed all of them i just followed every single one and you know that probably pays a lot of focus into the person that i am today thank you kobe and thank you everyone Grant, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to have you back at Unbound. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, One advantage, I guess, of Missouri's Poet Laureate position being relatively new is that we at Unbound can proudly say that we have hosted every Poet Laureate in the state's history. And that includes uh, our final poet this evening, Karen Crego, who did not attend the University of Missouri, I don't think, but we're still very happy to have her here. Uh, She's the author of two collections of poetry, Passing Through Humansville and No More Milk. She's also the editor and general manager of a small Missouri weekly newspaper, the Marshfield Mail, and co-editor with her husband of the distinguished literary journal, Mid-American Review. Karen is joining us from Springfield, I think. Please join me. Please join me in welcoming her to Unbound. Thank you for being here, Karen. Hi, thank you for having me, Gabe. I'm just thrilled to be here and um, so very moved by uh, what we've heard so far. Um, I have goosebumps. It's uh, just been a very moving reading so far. And my reading's not very moving. I have a bunch of poems about television I thought I'd share with you tonight. So um, there's that. First of all, though, I do have a Missouri poem uh, that I'd like to share. It's one that I was... Uh, asked to contribute to the New York Times for a roundup of Poets Laureate uh, work of gratitude. So this is one I wrote uh, right before Thanksgiving called Last Scraps of Color in Missouri. Today I passed a stand of trees, tall, closely packed, bare, and almost black from rain. 
but underneath I saw smaller trees just getting started on their slow snatch and grab of sky, and I saw these were golden still, and they glowed like campfires in the dark. Lately I'd been wanting a little light, and there it was, and all I had to do was turn my gaze a few degrees from center. Some blessings find us when we move to them. They're waiting only to be seen. Near the end of a difficult year, may we spot the light as we breathe in prayer or supplication. Show me, show me, show me. So that's a poem about the show me state. Um, slightly, well, much um, less pleasant poem about the show me state is one that I um, like to read to um, just remind us all of, of the path we're all on toward a better day. This is called Poem for Mama. It's for the mother of George Floyd. Someone kneeled on the neck of a man and now the man is gone. It's an old story, flesh muscling into flesh, the slim pipe of the trachea opening a little so hardly anything gets in or out. But what does manage to escape is his dead mother's name. I'm mom to my sons and I want to be a good one. They're white but kind and the young one doesn't understand but his brother begins to. And so I beg them both the way all mothers should for George's mom, whose name I can't find but whom we all know as mama. For mama, please be a witness, be a witness. As Poet Laureate of Missouri, I get to be a witness to um, so many beautiful things here. I just wanna make sure that I don't forget the things that um, um, also make us who we are and that we should all keep in mind. Uh, before I got ready for this reading, I thought, well, I'm so tired of, of my voice. And I went through some old files and thought, I just wanna look at some things I wrote that maybe um, I haven't read before. And I just found a bunch of stuff that I barely remembered writing and I was excited about it. So I thought maybe I'd share that excitement with you. With this, um, my B-sides, they're not really B-sides, they're just things I, I wrote and liked and put aside and then forgot that it existed. So here's one called Morning of the Equinox. I woke today just after, typical. There was a moment of perfect balance and I missed it, but I'm right on time for the slow glide into dark the balance tipped toward night. Look, I'm discouraged and I'm starting to think it's about me, the sun turning its shoulders, the sycamore out back throwing down, the fraught fuckets of butterfly wings as they gather to head south. There's a chill in the air and I blame their frenzied flapping, blame myself somehow, queen of what's autumnal, monarch of empty trees. I always seem to miss the moment of the equinox. So. Pardon the F word. That's the thing about finding poems that you forgot existed. You forget the bad words in them. Okay. The way the wood sighs with you. I come from a long line of fire builders, but somewhere I lost the Ken. Come the apocalypse. I'll be the cold one, cheeks fat with suspicious berries. Some of us won't make it long. Too much has been forgotten. We step on every dry twig. It's easy to hear us coming. But our intentions are good. We never stop paying attention, make careful note of how paralysis climbs our limbs. It's just that there's an art to piling logs, one we never le learn to master. We forget there's no fire if we fail to leave a space for air. Hints of my meditation practice there. Always trying to make space for air. I have kids and I write about them constantly. And if you've ever read anything by me, it's probably been about one of my kids, Keats and Copernicus. No pressure kids with names like that. Um, here's a poem about explaining the concept of zero to my younger son. Here's the steeple. Yesterday I explained zero. How many rhinos do I have? None. Same as the number of birthday cakes, zebras, daisies up my nose. By contrast, here's my one nose, 
one nightgown, one finger pointing past the ceiling. I still see a baby when I look at him, but where I insist there is one baby, he lumps it with rhinoceri on the other side of the scrim where multitudes wait their turn to be called. Without zero, we could have no religion, the bulwark we erect against nothing. Where there is math, architecture can happen. The angles, the planes he begins to understand by hand. Here's the church. And as he'll learn, there are precious few things to which we can't append a steeple. I show him how to open the door, and there they are, everyone who is hiding, now standing in the open to wave. Okay, those TV pro poems I mentioned. Um, I'm taking a chance because um, because I have this captive audience. I can't even see your faces. I really enjoyed writing these poems about classic TV because I was always a rerun junkie. And I, I read them once, only once, to a group. And they were nice and polite, but I could tell, like, they don't know these shows because they're younger than I am. And they also don't even understand why somebody would watch a rerun because you can have your choice of, of things to watch. Um, and also there are smart people who like poetry and they don't care about TV. <laughs> so I might have to explain a couple of these as we go. This one, there was a show when I was young called, um, the what's it, what was it called? Wide World of Sports. Um, and my whole family would watch it. Every Saturday, we'd all gather, and they would show two sporting events, and they were crazy. They were like, well, the poem explains it, but just picture the Crago family sitting around the TV watching rattlesnake roundups and stuff like that. Um, it started with the most fabulous um, beginning, uh, spanning the globe to bring you, and, it, and there was this moment with a ski jumper that's mentioned in here where they would say the, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat, and that, that's prominent in the poem. The Agony of Defeat. Saturdays, my family ate what was served. Drag racing, rodeo, rattlesnake roundup, always two events, far from each other, cliff divers of Mexico, followed by axles and toe loops and sow cows. We had no sense then we were lucky, just luckier than those snakes looping into frenzied caduceus before entering the dark of the bag. This was before cable, when we'd negotiate which channel of three, only agreeing on Jim, Jim McKay in his natty mustard coat. I like the loggers best, fast sawing in pairs, pedaling to stay atop a floating log. It would be a lie from any of us if we denied what we tuned in for. Vinko Bogatai cartwheeling off the ski jump, proving weakly a wrong move, incalculably small, can make everything fall apart. So if you don't know Wide World of Sports, you probably still got that. A show I think you might know is Happy Days. Um, I think Henry Winkler, who played Fonzie, is like my favorite person on Twitter. So, um, but there's, there's a character you probably don't know, unless you're a junkie, and that's Chuck Cunningham. He's the older brother of Richie and, and uh, Joni Cunningham, sort of the main family. He was in in the, the first few episodes and then disappeared. So here's a little epigraph first um, for a poem called Your Life as Chuck Cunningham. Cunningham's eldest child and Richie's older brother went out for basketball practice one day and was never heard from again. Um, that's from IMDb. Disposable jock, slim tower of dumb. This is your life as Chuck. Basketball confidant, excused from the table to practice your shots. One day you live there, the next disappeared. You must have done a very bad thing. Joni, Richie, mom and dad, they all got together somewhere off screen and vowed never to breathe your name after the middle of season two. You became a ghost in your own memories. You dreamed yourself into a nice family story. You were the tall one, the flunky, Joe College. The parts didn't seem to fit. Your only friend was the round one. He came back to you each and every time, the thunk, thunk, thunk of his faithful heart until he left your palm, touched by nothing but tendrils of net. 
Okay, there's another character uh, called Jenny Piccolo. And she's, what do you call that kind of character in literature who you never see, just sort of works out. There's a name for this. Um, but she they introduced her later in the, the show, but early on it was just like, Jenny Piccolo says this, and, and she was just mythical. So this is called Jenny Piccolo Says. I liked it better when Jenny Piccolo existed only as idea, a disembodied id trolling the hallways of Jefferson High. Jenny Piccolo says, Joni would begin, and anything might follow in the moment before Howard interrupts. But sometimes life is complicated. You bring a beatnik home, you bought a lemon, you got on the wrong side of the Falcons. It happens. There are things you don't learn at the hardware store, things you need to know if you ever make it to inspiration point or find yourself drunk at a strip club. Marion won't tell you, but Jenny Piccolo can. Howard says when she graduates, Jefferson High will retire her number, her phone number, that is, but anyone can find that on the wall of Fonzie's office. And anyway, Frankie Avalon has it and looks her in the eye when he sings Venus, season nine, episode 15, during the poo doodah at Howard's Leopard Lodge. And I, future bad girl, saw it on TV. And yes, I cheered her on. And I did. Scrolling past all the shows you have never heard of before. If you've seen the Munsters, they're a monster family. Uh, I'm, I'm saying this for like the two people maybe who haven't seen the Munsters when I hope most of us have seen the Munsters, but they're, they're monsters. There's like a Frankenstein's monster who's the the dad and there's a um, Dracula's, Bride of Dracula character is his wife. So this is this is about their daughter um, Marilyn and Marilyn looks kind of like Marilyn Monroe. She's beautiful. Monster. Lily. Poor Marilyn is, well, to put it bluntly, less attractive than the rest of the family. Herman. You might say she's the ugly duckling. That's from season one, episode 12. Looks aren't everything. Still, a boy would be nice. Someone to slide over next to, to offer me his jacket to kiss me goodnight on the porch, but that's where it all goes wrong. I close my eyes and lean in, and just like that, they're gone in a cloud of dust and rubber. Thank heavens for family, for the comfort of a cool embrace, for a few who accept me just the way I am, colorless hair, eyes blank as sky, cheese, cheeks so fever pink, I've caught more than one man staring, seeing the looks my family shares. There's pity, yes, but kindness. They love me hideous. Maintain the hope that someone may look closely and see a little something more. So Marilyn's under the impression that she's just tremendously ugly. And of course, she's gorgeous. Um, so the Brady Bunch, you probably know from at least... Um, Marsha, Marsha, Marsha memes, right? So this is a an episode where Bobby, um, the young son, wanted to, he had a hero and his hero was Jesse James. And he ran around with his guns pretending he was Jesse James. And because they're the Bradys, they came up with a, a way to teach him that the wrongness of his thinking. So in this poem goes into that. Starts again with a, a quote. Emptying the clip. Oh, I need to mention, I wrote this on the day that um, the Pulse nightclub shooting happened. And and it started me on a journey where I wrote um, a series of American sentences. You can find them on Twitter under American sentences um, about, I chose a, a shooting every day and wrote about it. So this is sort of, even though it's a TV poem, I um, kind of started me on this little journey. I'm turning in my guns. I don't ever want to see another gun again. And that's Bobby on the Bobby's Hero episode of the Brady Bunch. And it's in my voice. If I'm honest, I wanted a place to hide. All day, scenes of fear rewound. So much blood as strangers carried others clear of harm. Listen, I'm the queen of reruns, but some things I can barely see once. So I flipped to a classic, and it's the one where Bobby falls in love with a gunman and pretends to be him, Jesse James. 
He twirls his six shooter like sparklers, shredding shrapnel of light. Mike and Carol make a plan, call an old man, tall and skinny, a stockpile of elbows and knees. He tells Bobby how James shot his father in the back, which was his way, and how his mother never gave up crying. That night, Bobby dreams a train and Jesse boarding and Jesse shooting every Brady down the line. Three clicks up, horror, bullets flying, people holding very still beneath the cooling bodies of friends, and there's nowhere any of us can hide. Thank you so much for your attention and for this great event. And, and um, thank you to the Unbound Book Festival and Daniel Boone Regional Library and, and our hosts. Thank you to the three poets who read so beautifully tonight. And um, and Karen, thank you for thanking our sponsor this evening. I'll thank them again, Daniel Boone Regional <laughs> yes. Library. Um, and thank you all for being here. On Thursday, we'll be back with more wonderful poetry for you. We have a reading with uh, Jay Despondi, Jenny Z, and Claire, uh, and Claire Womanholm. And so we hope to see you then. Um, thank you for joining us and thanks again to our poets.